Oh, yeah, I, I just want to say two things. One of them, we have here in the audience, not on the program, people who could be a full substitute for the program. <laughs> <laughs> just as interesting, just as knowledgeable, just as well connected in everything. So, uh, if they're not here on the podium, so to speak, it's partly by coincidence. Yeah. More generally, just in case people, because this is a contentious environment, and people sometimes think, why is this and why is that? Uh, is this industry overrepresented? Is that region underrepresented, like Australia, for example? Um, if, if anybody thinks that this was kind of like by design, you're vastly overestimating us. Okay, some of the people are not here and here because we invited them and they just couldn't make it. And some people we just overlooked, but there is no agenda here in terms of the content of the program. And so now, uh, Judith O'Neill, uh, who uh, many of you know from her international involvement, but she also ran for CITI, a wonderful conference that we had in Zambia earlier this year about broadband as a video platform for Africa. Thank you. All right. Good morning, welcome back, and we'll welcome everybody as they continue to come in. Um, thank you, Ellie, for the introduction. Uh, we do have at least two French speakers on our panel. I'm not taking that as a political statement, um, but it's a wonderful language. Um, our panel is about the impact of OTT, um, and to look at the impact, we need to assess, obviously, the risks and the rewards of what is happening in the transformational environment. Um, Ernst & Young put out earlier this year its risk radar for 2012. They put 10 points on that. I selected five of those, which seem to me to be the most important and the most crucial for particularly what our panel is looking at, what they're going through, and what they have to contend with as they go through this game change in the sector. Um, the first one of that is not a, not a new one. It's, it's quite old, but it requires um, significantly more acute attention and is more challenging. And that is um, the risk of disengaging from the changing customer mindset. The customer mindset continues to change all the time. And our, our um, intensity in predicting and looking at the customer mindset is very important. We saw some of that in Jackie's slide this morning in Verizon, having the customer as the driver in, in the center of that. That is now more important than everything. The second one that I selected is failure to capitalize on types of connectivity. Um, Professor Schultz Grin, uh, Grin mentioned in an interview uh, recently that we are in an environment of device independence. We want everything on every device simultaneously all the time, and that's going to require a lot of connectivity, which requires a lot of investment, a lot of cooperation. Um, and the next one is failure to determine business metrics, and that's in the cooperation sense. We heard everyone say this morning, we can't do this ourselves, we're going to have to cooperate, we're going to have to have a community, we're going to have to do either individual agreements or global agreements, or we're going to have to have a government with an excess budget like Australia, very few of those around, um, and to actually build the infrastructure, otherwise we're going to have to team together um, and do all of that. And then, uh, obviously, lack of organizational flexibility is an enormous risk now, it's always been a risk for any business, and now it's particularly acute. So let's look at that. Hold it up, okay. Can, can you not hear? Do I not speak loudly enough? Is this New Yorker not doing her job? <laughs> so, um, okay, so let's take a look at that from the perspective of the players in the industry, what they're doing, what they're facing, um, how, they're, how they're coming on to this. Um, for example, from a supplier's point of view, Alcatel-Lucent, we're looking at a changing environment, changing consumer demands, which we don't even know ourselves what we want, but we know that we want everything. We're very megalomaniacal about our devices, about our content, and about how we receive things. Um, and a supplier to the carriers, to the industry, has to figure all of this out in advance to prepare for the supply. Does that require an entire restructuring of the company? We saw an announcement uh, two months ago well, in July of this year by Alcatel-Lucent that they were cutting 5,000 jobs, that's roughly 6.4% of their workforce, and that pales in comparison to Nokia Siemens' announcement 
that they're cutting 17,000 jobs, which is 25% of their workforce. Then we're seeing severe acute drops in share prices, in stock prices down to 25, uh, drop of as steep as 25%. We heard from Eve this morning that the mobile market in Europe is down 3%, and yet we see on the European Technology Index um, for 2012, it is actu actually up 4.1%. So there is a shift going on here, clearly. We all know that. How do we maximize on that? How do we take advantage of that? From the carrier's point of view, are there advantages um, in this whole shift, in this OTT transformation? For example, um, there's anticipation that the iPhone 5 is going to be a massive seller in Europe, as it is showing to be in the United States, and that this will be a coveted advantage. Orange has access to the iPhone 5 in Europe. Telefonica and Vodafone, for example, may not have such access. Will that push them into the arms of Samsung? Will that mean something greater or lesser? Uh, will that be an advantage for Orange? Will that be something they can seize on and have, have a benefit from um, the OTT and the new devices? Um, similarly, while everybody's getting together to be all cooperative and to share everything, uh, what is the role of these incredible intellectual property lawsuits. Um, Google, for example, inherited the mobile mobility lawsuit in Europe that recently had uh, a very vigorous decision by the German court. And now we're seeing granular distinctions of whether the rounded edge of a tablet um, is the critical, important patented piece versus a square edge of the tablet. And how granular will the courts get in determining these different uh, patent possessions, which affect, obviously, the, um, the economics of the business. So with all of that, um, we have a lot of impact in virtually every aspect of the industry on the suppliers, on the carriers, on ourselves, the users, um, and on the regulators for certain. Um, we, we have heard the, uh, the infrastructure sharing of Australia. That will not happen in the United States. I'm sure we will hear that. Um, from our regulatory speaker, but, uh, but how, how is that going to be addressed in the new environment? So our first speaker is Gabrielle Gatier of Alcatel-Lucent, and we invite Gabrielle to the podium. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you a few thoughts about these exciting times. Um, Definitely shifting environment, and Alcatel-Lucent, as was said, is uh, an observer, a part of this value chain, okay, bottom of this value chain, perhaps. Um, and um, what I'm going to say is um, mainly based on uh, the initiative that uh, we, uh, that Neely Cruz launched uh, and that we, we, we were driving um, last year, um, about what about the possible consequences of this shift in value um, on this disruption, um, both on business models, new business models to be, to be reinvented, and also new investments um, and perhaps regulatory uh, patterns and frameworks. Uh, so I will first um, be quick on this because you know um, most of it is already well known. We have never faced such an unprecedented data explosion. And to be very honest, uh, we have not anticipated it well. The industry usually has difficulties in anticipating, but this time we have not seen that. Uh, in the 400 biggest cities of the world, in five years, we will move from 400 devices per, uh, connected per square kilometer to 13,000. Um, mobile data traffic is due to to increase by a factor of 25, well, we have, you can have other numbers, it doesn't mean anything, but it's, it's huge, mainly due to the explosion, of course, of devices, but also of video over these devices, um, which puts a great, great stress on networks, both wireline and wireless. It's, of course, the mobile data explosion which is at stake, but as I will come out later, the future of wireless is wireline, I think. Uh, Minister Conroy had um, made a big emphasis of this, and it's true. What, is, what are the responses? Stress on spectrum, three ways to handle this, more spectrum, but we know it's not expandable. More efficient technologies, like LTE, uh, but that require also larger bands, so 
should not we think of another way of allocating these bands? And I will come back to this. And of course, other topographies, smaller cells, to densify um, capacity, to enhance the capacity in what we call heterogeneous networks, both with macro and pico cells. And of course, behind all this, you need backhaul, uh, ex um, acceleration of backhaul. We have big debates in, in Europe, in, in all countries. Is it really FTTH? Is it FTT to the cabinet? It's fiber as deep as economically uh, feasible, and it depends the horizon. Of course, the end game is fiber, but it depends um, the horizon you take. Now, this, of course, requires a lot of investment. In Europe, it was measured as the, investment, the necessary investment was about 300, 300 billion euros in the next uh, uh, 15 years, um, in a context where revenues uh, of service providers are seriously decreasing um, under pressure. And they're also very much attacked, of course, as, and this is the topic of the day, by the rising of the over-the-top players, who increasingly also eat on the, on the service provider's plate in a lot of domain. And um, the, this little diagram shows where service providers are attacked by over-the-tops, over less in the access, but in the voice, in the messaging, in the video, of course, in the app stores, and the, in the m-commerce. Other context, um, of course, investment is needed, and that was the reason for the initiative. EU will not meet its digital agenda targets, um, and EU is lagging behind. I can tell you in the figures of my company, we see the dynamic of investment. It's definitely not in Europe, and it's challenging for us, very challenging. It's in Asia, it's in developing countries, it's in North America, in, in mobile, um, but it's not in Europe. So. This was the, the purpose to, for Nilly Cruz to launch this. The world is not flat, for sure. The US has a very different framework with a large market um, versus Europe, which has a fragmented market. Uh, there is supposed to be competition between cable and, um, um, and uh, the telcos, which was seen from Europe sometimes as a way to accelerate. Uh, the, the investment, at least uh, for a number of years in FTTX. Um, you have a market which is very tech-savvy in smartphones and apps, aggressive LT deployments. In Europe, we, have, we come from a regulatory um, uh, tradition where um, in some countries we do have com uh, platform-based competition between cable and the telcos, but in a lot of them, we have what we call active infrastructure competition on top of a common passive network. The LLU is a common passive copper network. Um, and of course, uh, the, um, there is this revenue problems of the, of the telcos, uh, which makes it difficult for them to invest today. In APAC, again, very different um, um, landscape. Uh, a lot of, I will come back to this, um, uh, government involvement in, um, in and especially these uh, network separation models. America vertically vertical integration platform competition in a nutshell. Uh, in Asia network separation service based competition that's that's very very roughly done. And in EMEA active infrastructure based competition and uh, targeted for less dense areas public intervention. Now. The, what is the main different characteristic of telcos and OTT? Telcos are local, national players. Very, very local, in, considered as local in, uh, in Europe, uh, at least. Um, they don't cover a continent uh, in Europe. They have usually fixed and mobile infrastructures, and they offer key services such as voice, although 80% of their uh, traffic will soon come from data, 80% of their revenue is still in voice. So problem to monetize uh, this data and they're challenged by these data explosion. They need to find new business models. At the same time, they need to invest to migrate to LTE and to fiber in a context of declining revenue. The OTTs are global players. They have a global internet footprint. They have no local infrastructure. They have some infrastructure, but not locally. Um, but major OTT players are connected to uh, telcos, and they have an interaction. They offer applications and services worldwide. Uh, they're major players. And the media are global players, but regulated nationally. They produce content, which is referenced and distributed by the telcos. They sell content 
in uh, many ways, many times, with national release windows. What can the telcos do to, to counterattack uh, and to regain value? Um, develop OTT-like services, cloud, enhance the, the, the quality of service, and uh, develop, um, um, of course, yes, end-to-end um, -end quality of service. That's uh, one of the best. I will be short on Europe. Uh, don't have time. Uh, we're trying to shift some of the regulatory. We need to shift from the former regulatory framework to enhance, to attract investment again in our markets. Fiber. FTTH is, of course, the end goal, not a must. We have increasingly new technological solutions like virtual unbundling, like vectoring, that allow next generation beat stream on top of a common infrastructure. Um, and uh, solutions should not only be built on geographically segmented. We have too segmented too much geographically. Uh, in 80%, on 80% of the European territory, there is no room for two passive infrastructures. And we still are too much advocating for platform competition. Infrastructure competition is, not an, uh, is a buzzword. We should move to active infrastructure competition on top of a common passive network. We can't now afford, in a time of financial constraint, these two. Now we have to face this. What does that mean for mobile? When you consider a network, it's three different layers. We, have, we are faced by the necessity, and it's the first time in history, to replace. It's the electrification of Europe to replace this, pass this, um, this copper network with fiber. Trenches, duct fiber, dark fiber is 80% of the cost. It's going to be there for 40 years. And it's, um, um, on top of it, you have active networks, what we sell, which is five, seven years rate of return, with 20% uh, of the cost. And then you have the, the services, the context, the apps, where the service providers must compete now. But they're faced with a global competition on the, on the first layer, on the th third layer, sorry. It should be European on the second layer. The first one is very local, very local. How can you finance the same way, these three layers? Impossible. And we do, we have seen that in this initiative that there are long-term infrastructure funds ready to invest and co-invest with the operators on the first layer. They, they, they accept longer rate of returns than the, than the telcos, but they want to be sure that they they have a safe return on investment. But long term, 15, 20 years. Now, yes, we are in the middle of the discussion of the Connect Europe facility, and it's a great opportunity to leverage these type of new funds. So we have discussions. Perhaps I will tackle that in the questions. We have some ideas. It shouldn't be subsidy. It shouldn't be sprinkle funding. It should be fundamental to reorganize the sector uh, with a new industry vision. Um, What's happening outside Europe? We increasingly see um, operators facing the scarcity of fund and scarcity of spectrum sometimes, engage on a voluntary basis, not only government driven, on a voluntary basis in infrastructure sharing agreements. We have seen that already in the fixed and the backhaul, many ways. New, what is new is in developing countries we see that in the bands where it's, um, it's, um, the spectrum is scarce, the golden digital dividend bands, where you don't have enough spectrum for three or four carriers, where it makes sense to have big chunks. So we see models, very um, innovative models, encouraged, it's true, by governments, because you have to have the, 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 um, the encouragement of the regulator and of the government that gives the spectrum to a sort of consortium of operators for the digital dividend, these are models we see in Mexico, in Kenya, um, very innovative, uh, new, only in these bands, and of course on the rest of the bands where the spectrum is not scarce in the 2.6, the operators still compete. But we should perhaps, when we're trying to cover less, less, um, area, less dense areas in Europe and we see the natural um, co-investment and cooperation of operators, we should perhaps um, take advantage of these new innovative models. It's reverse innovation. These models will first take place, and these allow some countries like Kenya to leapfrog to LTE, which is the only way to have broadband in less dense areas. We should perhaps look at this. Finished. Now, NGA rollout is not a gradual evolution, and we are facing a real revolution. It's, uh, and what basically we have to rebuild 
mainly in, in the, at the core of Europe, on 80% of the territory, is an essential infrastructure for the next 40 years to come. And we have to do this with a time frame of 15 years, not to make revenue in the next three years. How do we do that in a time of financial constraint? This requires, I think, new, innovative and flexible solutions. And I hope, at last, that uh, the decisions to come in the EU, especially on the funds, will help shape this. Um, so new investment models, new regulatory thinking also in some way in the way the spectrum is allocated will be needed to attract long-term investors in NGA. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, we heard words like revolution, unprecedented flexibility, and of course spectrum. Um, and all of this is very true, uh, very true, and we know that we are in uncharted waters here when we hear the suppliers say, let's be efficient and all share um, what we are supplying instead of supplying it multiple times, but that actually makes a lot of economic sense at the end of the day, as does the Connect Europe that was talked about. We're seeing an experiment on that in the Caribbean. There's a project called Connect the Caribbean partly through the ITU that is being somewhat successful on a different level than what you're talking about for this type of infrastructure. But also, um, we heard the important role of the regulator coming into this and regulatory cooperation to help the industry or to, to work with the industry to get through these challenges and to um, put in a regulatory infrastructure that is sensible for investors and that works for the consumers as well. Um, so our next speaker is Emmanuel Rochat, who is going to give us the carrier's point of view from France Telecom Orange. Good morning. Um, very happy to be here today with you. I uh, would like to, uh, to share with you some ideas on one question which I hear very, uh, very often, which is what's the future for uh, multiple uh, domestic networks in a globalized OTT world? Um, so obviously, the, from my perspective, the, the most structural impact of OTT on the, on the telcos um, is that by decoupling the network and the services, um, they, have, uh, they push us, uh, telcos, to rethink our uh, historical vertical model. Um, in the, on the services uh, uh, area, the OTT have created um, a, a new and very challenging for us uh, competitive paradigm, and for three reasons. The first one is that they have different uh, business models. Uh, and uh, with these different business models, they, uh, they can afford to, uh, to position uh, communication services, which are our core business, as a free or, or almost free um, services to their users in order to feed their own business models, be it audience or, or, or whatever. Uh, so we have to adapt to that. And, uh, and Stéphane uh, Dufour presented a way uh, to adapt to that, uh, the way Swisscom has chosen in terms of pricing. The second reason why uh, this competition is new is uh, uh, it's become uh, the fall uh, uh, under different regulatory regime and, and that they have uh, uh, very often very lighter constraint that we have in terms of, uh, of personal uh, data protection, in terms of uh, legal interception, in terms of also in, of tax regimes, in, in particular in Europe, uh, and that we have to, uh, to deal with that. And the, thir the third reason is, uh, and we come here to, uh, to global versus local, um, is that they are global players, whereas the, the telcos are essentially domestic or multi-domestic uh, players. So the, the OTTs in a, in a few years uh, are, have been able to build a customer or user bases which are at the same level or even higher than the, than the biggest customer base we see in the telco area. Uh, think about the 1 billion uh, users of, of Facebook in uh, something like eight, eight, eight years' time, uh, 500 million for, uh, for Twitter, 450 uh, million uh, iTunes um, accounts with credit cards uh, linked to that. Uh, and you look at the biggest telcos, China Telecom, 680 uh, million uh, customers, Vodafone, 400 million uh, customers, and it took uh, decades for, to them to, uh, to build this customer base. So this ability, uh, the major telcos have to build quickly a very high uh, scale, uh, allows them to, um, to shape uh, uh, market and industry trend and, and industry uh, standards. In the telco uh, world, if, if, if we want to, uh, uh, to build this type of, uh, of uh, shape in such a short uh, uh, amount of time, we need to go through uh, uh, processes of standardization, which are working and for, for years, but are still very, uh, 
lengthy and, and complex. Uh, if I want to elaborate a little bit more on this uh, uh, local versus global, and, and I think the question is very, uh, um, is very relevant, uh, whether uh, we can live as, uh, as local player in this, uh, in this world which is globalizing. Um, and the answer is not straightforward. For me, there is a, a big difference between the network business, which is, uh, which is essentially grounded into the geography. Uh, the assets are, are, are linked to the geography. Uh, the regulation is, uh, is essentially uh, national. Uh, also, the, the, we have a number of people on the, on, the, on the field which have to be there, the field ops, the, the, the customer service, the, the shops. Um, and this, um, uh, uh, and this, uh, and this network asset are, are also uh, very uh, strategic for uh, for national governments. That's uh, uh, that that makes the network business uh, very uh, very linked to uh, to, our, to their domestic uh, uh, lands. Uh, on top of that, when you look at the synergies in the network businesses, uh, you see a lot in uh, in, uh, in market synergies for tower codes and network sharing and everything, and much less when you look cross border. Um, and finally, this uh, this local anchor uh, that we have as telco, uh, we should not uh, uh, deny it because it's uh, it's an asset. It's uh, it's providing us with differentiating assets that uh, that are difficult to replicate the local presence the local insertion in, into the ecosystems, uh, the trust, the knowledge of the, of the local uh, and public authorities. Uh, so we need to build on that. That's for, that's for the network business. If we look at the service business, this is where the, the, the scale is critical and we see uh, how, the, how the, the OTT are, 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 uh, successful, uh, are successful in this area. And if the, if the telco wants to, uh, to remain in this uh, service area, they need to address this scale uh, issue. Um, and I see four approaches uh, uh, very quickly to, uh, to be able to address this, uh, uh, this issue of scale. The first one is uh, cross-border uh, 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 consolidation of networks, so acquiring uh, one telco, acquiring another one, just to get a bit more reach and scale. Uh, this is uh, probably relevant in, uh, in areas with a lot of fragmentation, like in Europe, where you have 120 uh, mobile network operators uh, for a population which is quite, um, quite similar to the one of the US. Uh, but still, it's very complex, it's very costly, and, and the value created by this uh, cross-border consolidation is yet to be demonstrated. So you have another way to, uh, to, build, this, uh, to build this scale is to, uh, to partner, and this is uh, what some, uh, some telco are doing. We, uh, as Orange, are doing... Uh, a partnership with uh, Dutch Telecom in a number of areas just to try to uh, to, make, to create uh, synergies, uh, to try to uh, to build a bit of scale, a bit of uh, of, uh, of flexibility. The second approach is uh, is about telco standardization, uh, but this this one requires to uh, profoundly rethink uh, or remodel the way we uh, we standardize in the in the telco industry because we we lack of flexibility, we lack of uh, of, of time to market. Uh, there are a number of initiatives to accelerate standardization. Uh, uh, one of them is within the framework of the GSMA. Five, five operators in Europe have, uh, have worked together just to try to accelerate on some key topics uh, for, the, for the telcos. Uh, some, uh, the two of them are the rich communication suite standard and the uh, SIM-based NFC standard, which are success, uh, a success in terms of standardization and uh, in time to market. Um, that's standardization. The, th the third approach is uh, what I call the local play or niche play, which means that the telco can choose to, uh, to reinforce its, uh, its uh, domestic uh, nature by, uh, by focusing on the, on the areas of services where its local assets are really differentiating. And there are some of them because not all the services are, are relevant for, uh, for global, uh, for globality. Uh, I think about uh, I think about payment, for example. I think about contact contactless services. I think about healthcare, which are very uh, the, the, the the local presence of the of the telco can be um, can be a real asset to develop in these areas. And the final approach is uh, is the OTT play, which means that uh, uh, telcos can can choose to uh, to develop, to partner, to acquire services in the digital area, and uh, uh, distribute those services. In, on their network uh, footprint, but also beyond in a pure OTT mode. So that's uh, the choice of a, a frontal competition in terms of, uh, uh, of services. But this is, uh, uh, we, have, we see some initiatives in this area, 
uh, in particular in particular in uh, in Asia for for some years. Uh, you have uh, SK, SK Telecom in uh, in Korea or NTT in Japan, uh, but also in Europe with uh, with initiative from Telefonica Digital or what we did as Orange when we acquired uh, Daily Motion and a number of partnership which we uh, we uh, we close with uh, with uh, OTT players. So finally, in the uh, as a, maybe other conclusion or, or to or to recap all, all, all those elements. Um, for sure, and this is very structural, the OTT have, have shaken our vertical model, and that's a, that's a fact. Uh, and we need to, uh, to adapt to that. It's not fighting against, but adapting to that. Um, uh, we, the, the network uh, business, will still remain really grounded to the, to the, to the geographies, and we need to, to leverage on that, uh, not, uh, not deny that, uh, that uh, multi-domestic uh, multi nature we have. And, uh, and finally, we have a number of assets on which we can build to still be present in the service areas, uh, even if we are not uh, OTTs. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Emmanuel, for that presentation and an interesting observation about the very local geographic nature of networks. Um, in fact, they are attached to the land in many cases and how one can distinguish oneself um, in the differentiation of products and services and applications in healthcare, maybe even emergency alert systems. And perhaps, um, as Orange does, uh, hopefully effectively, in other local markets. So expand the number of mo local markets that are working for um, the carrier in different parts of the world, in Africa and Latin America and other places to perhaps leverage um, changes that are going on more rapidly in the industrialized world in Europe. Uh, to the extent those markets allow it. Um, and uh, our next speaker is Professor Henning Schulze-Rene, is that how you say yep. it? Okay, from the FCC, Columbia University, everywhere. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about an aspect that I think, I, we, as far as I can tell, we have not discussed in great detail, uh, namely uh, the impact and relationship of over-the-top services, and I'll be primarily focusing on interactive communication, what are generally known as voice services, uh, but really think of this as real-time communication services beyond voice, and the traditional landline and, to some extent, uh, mobile uh, voice business. The problem we've had uh, is that we, we have had a global real-time communication infrastructure of a public switch telephone network for 100 plus years, and it has uh, accumulated, actually, a number of quite desirable characteristics uh, that I'm trying to tabulate here on the right. Um, and we should, as we progress towards an all IP network, not forget what those characteristics were, because if you've ever dealt with many of the over-the-top applications, it is not obvious uh, that they all maintained that. So for example, global connectivity is generally not assured in those applications if you want to reach a Skype user. Uh, if you want to reach somebody via Skype, that other person better have Skype installed on their machine and running. Uh, reliability, uh, generally speaking, I mean, legacy systems have a pretty good record, both in regular day-to-day -day circumstances, as well as when things aren't going so well. When the power is out, which in the US obviously happens uh, with some fair regularity, uh, but also uh, in terms of infrastructure diversity. Uh, they're much easier to use than many successor uh, services are. You can teach a, uh, a three-year-old how to dial a telephone number uh, quite easily. Uh, they're designed for emergency usage uh, in a variety of ways, 911 services being a classical example. And for a number of years now, they've had a, uh, both encouraged by uh, our policy as well as uh, implemented by uh, private en entities, they've had a tradition of uh, serving users that need additional accommodation hearing aid compatibility, interfacing with teletype type devices for text communication, the video relay service, all things that are hard to replicate on many over-the-top services. And they've had a tradition of privacy, 
Uh, you, you had customer private network information. You had uh, the notion that you could assume more or less, unless you were the target of a free letter agency, that the content of your communication was somewhat sacred. Uh, it was a tradition, a custom, a culture uh, of privacy. And it was relatively cheap in the sense that uh, the cost per minute is uh, pretty low. However, on the, uh, on the not so great side, clearly it's a limited service. It's voice only, largely speaking. Uh, the quality, even on the voice side, is four kilohertz, which hasn't increased I mean, since uh, Alexander Graham Bell. And it's hard to control. Uh, as we have more international ones, you get, and you can no longer tell where phone numbers might be located uh, because of uh, uh, wireless roaming, uh, you get calls at 2 a.m. because uh, not even a telemarketer, but because somebody didn't know where you were at, at that moment. I uh, 911 system doesn't work terribly well anymore uh, in a variety of circumstances. Some of you are familiar with the Duetro incident in the uh, Washington DC area where major metropolitan area lost 911 service for uh, a day or more. Uh, you don't have universal text and video, they're all just bolted on. And security is basically on the trust us, we are a carrier model, which doesn't quite work when you have a much more diverse infrastructure. The other technical point that I wanted to make is that we tend to divide the world neatly into two buckets. There's over the top on the kind of more modern side, if you like, recent arrival, and then there is the infrastructure side uh, that you have the infrastructure-based services or to use the language of the FCC or Internet order, uh, the specialized services, uh, voice and uh, cable video being uh, classic examples of those. However, that I think is insufficient to really understand that we're talking about not two neat buckets where you can just easily stick any technology into one of the two, but we have really a continuum of solutions that have different characteristics. They differ in terms of their interconnection with the existing legacy network or with any E-164 telephone number. They differ in the security and reachability characteristics, and in particular, they differ in terms of the quality of service characteristics. I wanted to point out two that are not as obviously on the market today, but I think illustrate two possibilities uh, that are in the middle between the legacy uh, type of uh, operator provided services modernized into IP possibly, the uh, uh, second box from, from the right, and the classical over the top services, interconnected or non interconnected. Namely, video relay service, uh, which currently clearly is only a service accessible uh, to people who are deaf or hard of hearing uh, and is a government funded service uh, in the US which illustrates the ability to have multimedia capability, but reachable by an E-164 telephone number and uh, universal connectivity, running uh, generally on standard IP uh, platforms. And in particular, new possibilities, and the first presentation alluded to that a little bit indirectly, namely that we could see that quality of service is an element which could be offered as a service which would allow third parties to get better service than they are able to do. And by better, I mean primarily more reliable, as I'll illustrate in, briefly in a, in a minute. Uh, this is not, quality of service is not an average concern, it is a uh, periodic concern, if you like. So again, in our discussion, the important point is we should not just divide the world into these neat buckets because the technology doesn't make that possible should think much more broadly in terms of dimensions of reachability and quality and security uh, as opposed to simply the world is OTT or it is not. So what are some of the key attributes that are, which I think we should look at preserving as we transition the public switch telephone network from its legacy circuit switched model to a voice of IP based model, whatever the organizational form over the top whatever that may mean precisely uh, or not. 
Without delving into the detail, I believe there are three core principles that have stood the PSDN in good stead over 100 years that I think we should be very reluctant to give up, namely universality, uh, public safety, and quality. Universality means that I can reach anybody on any media, not just voice, and it's available across geography, income, and disability. Public safety, 911, and other abilities, such as uh, the uh, citizen alerting, and quality, that is uh, both the qualities reasonably assured and predictable, and I can, uh, if there are quality problems, I can determine where those are. Some of you might be familiar with the rural car completion problem in the United States, where we have great difficulties for about 10% of the lines to assure the quality that we would all come to expect, even in, in a classical circuit switch environment. Less important are uh, uh, technology issues, whether this is wired or wireless packet circuits. We, I think those are things that evolve and have evolved, uh, as I'll try to illustrate in the, in the table on the right. Over time, we've dealt with those transitions. This is just one more transition in a long transition from a circuit analog to an all packet environment. One of the things in terms of uh, key features that we need for over-the-top services are consistent speeds. Uh, we're doing much better in that uh, than we were on the residential side even a year or two ago. Uh, that's part of a measurement broadband America project that the uh, commission is undertaking um, uh, on a continuing basis. But we still have uh, periodic quality of service uh, impairments that we need to deal with that we don't quite understand well enough as to how good a competitor can over the top be uh, in reality for a variety of reasons having to do with the last 10, ten feet as well as um, a packet loss and other issues uh, both vendor induced and otherwise uh, carrier induced in the network. As we transition we have uh, an opportunity for a virtual cycle that, after all, nobody buys internet service to do ping. Um, you, run it, you buy internet service because you have applications, so more over-the-top applications, among others, uh, motivate people to buy uh, services that they would not, not otherwise purchase, leading to a virtual cycle of investment if we can structure that correctly. So going forward, I believe we have begun to deal with that transition into a world which is no longer simply internet applications uh, on one side and legacy on the other. Uh, we have a uh, transition on interconnected VoIP. That's now reasonably well understood. We have intercarrier compensation in progress, which encourages and mandates uh, IP to IP interconnect. Uh, we have a transition to NG911 video relay services and other issues to deal with people with disabilities. And we have a number of technical and regulatory to do, such as how do we deal with legacy databases, authentication that was alluded to earlier, uh, the security model needs to be fixed, and we need to fix the vo voice of IP interconnection model. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that, Professor Schultz. Uh, um, it sounds like we're hearing very recurring themes, the, uh, the desirability of preserving certain uh, core attributes of the circuit switch system of the traditional system, cost money, they require investment, they require cooperation, they require all of the things that we've been talking about this morning, so it seems like we are not going to be able to escape both investing and dealing with each other, uh, which is not such a bad thing. Um, and, and that can lead to... Um, arrangements that actually work uh, to improve the carrier financial position. That part, um, it seems to me we have a lot more challenges than meet the eye on um, that, that we just heard perhaps from a regulator's point of view versus a carrier's point of view that uh, turning this um, economic syndrome around of uh, particularly uh, of the carriers involved in the sector to be able to generate the investment, to generate the income, to generate the, uh, the further investment and create a positive cycle um, may be more difficult from what we're hearing this morning than simply observing that we have to do this. Um, so with that, we move on to um, Rick Witt, who is going to talk to us uh, from the perspective of 
mobile mobility and Google's investment in mobile mobility and what you see with that. Great. And uh, you that up a little bit higher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good early afternoon, everybody. Um, actually, this is now for something somewhat different. Uh, I prepared these slides to talk more about the impact of OTT on the regulatory world. So in some sense, this is going to be a preview or an appetizer for the session this afternoon, and we'll talk in more detail about internet regulation. Um, I'm pleased to, to be here today to talk a bit about uh, a proposed framework for thinking about some of these issues, uh, ways of categorizing uh, some of the challenges we see, particularly in the, in the policy space. Um, and the takeaway I'm hoping to leave you with is that policymakers should do what they, they can to understand the functional integrity of the internet before they actually try to regulate things happening there. So many of you remember uh, last fall, uh, as the U.S. Congress was considering legislation to block uh, the online dissemination of unlawful content, the so-called SOPA and PIPA legislation. Um, both bills are based on the same basic premise to impose certain technical requirements on website owners, search engines, ISPs, and other entities. Now, there were dozens of notable network engineers, I think one or two in the room here, uh, as well as around the world, who actually submitted uh, detailed information to the U.S. Congress pointing out that this proposed means of filtering the internet's domain name system and other numbering and routing functions in the internet was problematic on at least two scores. First, that it could be easily circumvented by people with the right technical know-how, and second, that both the tech mandates and the circumventions themselves would adversely affect countless innocent uses of the internet. In other words, the pending legislation suffered from both ineffectiveness or under-inclusion and collateral damage or over-inclusion. It was a bad functional fit to the goal of minimizing online content piracy. Now, strangely and unfortunately, those voices were not heard in the halls of Congress in any of the congressional debates. They were not invited to any of the, to testify in front of Congress. Instead, the bills moved forward in both the House and the Senate and appeared relatively close to passage. Of course, many of you know what happened next. On January 18th, a host of online companies participated in what became known as Internet Blackout Day in protest over the bills. Some 115,000 individual websites committed what was the, the web's version of a collective work stoppage. Lawmakers received some 14 million email messages in the span of two days. Uh, and the response was predictably swift. The legislation would not be brought to the floor of either chamber. And despite their absence and deliberations, our friends, the internet nerds, it seems, had actually won the day. So why is that not the end of the story? <coughs> Despite the Internet Blackout Day, it's fair to say that many in Congress and elsewhere still do not have an informed appreciation for the structural and functional nature of the Internet. Instead, the debate turned into a classic political battle won only by unconventional but straightforward lobbying tactics rather than the power of legitimate ideas. The SOPA PIPA battle in the U.S. is just one of the major policy bookends for 2012, I would submit. This December, of course, the IQ will be considering dozens of member nation proposals that could have the effect of imposing government regulations for the first time on many internet activities. Now with SOPA PIPA, politics as usual won the moment. But frankly, this is not a desirable outcome. Such shows of political force are usually difficult to replicate, complicated to harness, and can quickly lose their novelty and their impact. Moreover, while most impressive and effective, at least for the moment, the show of force convinced politically without convincing intellectually. So for all practical purposes, as we've been talking about already today, the internet is becoming the chief operating system for our society. And yet confusion and misapprehension about the net's functions, its basic design attributes and architecture, remains frighteningly high. Perhaps the net community shares some of the blame for this predicament. For too long, we urged policymakers simply to look the other way whenever talk about internet regulation would surface. After all, many of us simply laughed when a certain US senator talked about the internet as a series of tubes, or a certain US president referred to the internets and the Google. We were convinced that ignorance about the net, it's just a big, mysterious, amorphous cloud, right, would lead our politicians to shy away from imposing laws and rules. Just don't regulate the internet, whatever that means, and everything would be fine. Unfortunately, it's become painfully obvious that the days of easy sloganeering are over. It's time for the internet community to step forward and explain itself. A new slogan I submit may now be appropriate, a more modest but well-grounded one to respect the functional integrity of the internet. Now, obviously, the net has fostered numerous collective, what I would call net benefits. They're listed here in the slide. Two things to keep in mind. One is we should not overlook, of course, the net challenges. 
things from bad acts and bad actors doing things online uh, to some of the, the societal challenges created by people being hyper-connected to some of the new business models. We've already talked about some earlier this morning. Uh, and the second point of that is that with these net challenges and net benefits, the things that actually enable the internet, the design architecture, the elements of the net itself are the fundamental background conditions that enable both. So we get both the benefits and the costs springing more or less from the same architecture. So what are those net, uh, those basic design features? Here are four I will submit that um, I think pretty well capture what it is about the internet that makes it unique um, as a technology platform. Uh, modular assembly or the what function, that's, that's layering. Essentially that's the structural foundations upon which much of the internet has been, has been founded. The where function of the end-to-end -end principle uh, translates to some as smart edges and dumb core, that's really, I think, overly broad. I think it's basically the point is that more functions, most functions can be completely and correctly implemented at the edges rather than the center of the network. The interconnected network, so the why, I think many people forget this was the fundamental reason for uh, the internet, not so much ARPANET, but the internet project was to connect disparate networks, to networks together. That was going back to the early 70s, and in some ways, that is the key aspect of the net. And finally, the agnostic protocols. The internet protocol is the one we're most familiar with, obviously. It's the bearer protocol that supports countless user activities above and networks below. Now, these design features didn't come out of nowhere, right? They were derived over many, many years by hundreds, if not thousands, of engineers working together organically and bottom up. Increasingly, once, once they became away from government control, in open and transparent standards processes uh, through rough consensus and well understood engineering principles. So I use the term integrity to talk about how, four, how these four microphenomena sort of fit together and function to create the user's overall experience of the internet. So how can we get a little bit more precise in terms of defining what we're trying to promote here? Um, here I will employ actually a martini glass. We usually talk about the hourglass, but this is a very sophisticated, worldly audience, so I assume a martini glass is slightly more appropriate. Uh, but the point is more or less the same. Um, we have sort of the layers of the OSI stack, and we can get into lots of details around wh what goes where. But I think at the bottom line, we have roughly three sets of layers, or three sets of functions within different layers of the internet. The, the top <coughs> layer, the upper layers of the apps and content, that's the over the top I think most of us have been talking about today. The middle layers are the logical functions, I'll return to them in a minute. And the, the lower layer functions, I like to call them under the bottom, right? I mean, it's the only fair, right? Over the top, under the bottom. But it's actually it's the physical functions, both the infrastructure and the protocols and standards that actually make them work. Things like DOCSIS 3, Ethernet, DSL, et cetera. Now, the part in the middle is what I would consider the essential waste of the martini glass, right? Without that, your drink spills over, and nobody wants that. These are the basic addressing and routing functions of the internet. So you've got layer three, which is the network or the IP layer. Layer four typically is TCP. Layer five are, this, are the, the, uh, the protocols such as HTTP, DNS, and others. Now this is the demarcation between the software that faces inward towards the network and the software that faces outward towards the user. This is really the glue that holds the internet together. And all four of the design attributes I mentioned before actually run through and help define those crucial middle layers. This also constitutes the place in the network where we have a variety of open standards bodies like the IATF, like W3C, all doing their thing every year, talking about working through difficult issues of implementation, updating, evolving the, uh, the network. So what I'm suggesting here is policymakers, above all, should respect the functional integrity of the internet, and particularly they should not try to uh, impose regulations that would violate or compromise the, the design attributes I've talked about in the middle layers. And my reasoning is because we have, one, all the amazing things that have happened because of those different attributes working together to create the integrity of the experience for users. And two, you already have processes in place where you have engineers, real experts, doing their thing day after day, year after year, to figure out what the net is today and what it will be evolving into tomorrow. My suggestion here as well is that we should think about this in the context of what I would think of as three dimensions. The first dimension is what I just talked about, the function of the network. What are you trying to affect with the proposed policy? But there are two other elements as well. One is the actual rule you're trying to adopt, anything from the constitutional change to an international treaty, to rules and regulations of a national domestic body, all the way down to the social norms uh, that typically uh, dictate in terms of a lot of these standards processes for the middle layers. And the third is then the players. So it's sort of the institutions and the organizations together uh, are, are part of this. And so it's not just so much 
what you're focusing on in terms of what's going on in the network, but also what rules and players you're employing to affect that. So here is a, a suggested way of trying to put all this together, uh, represented by the flaming adult beverage there on the left. Um, layers here provides the framing, but it's just a framing. Just don't get, I think, too hung up on some of the detail of that for now. The focus is on how the different dimensions fit together here in terms of the upper layers, middle layers, and lower layers. My point simply for today, and hopefully to help us for this afternoon's conversation, is that national and international political bodies should defer as much as possible to the middle layer functions. Uh, because, again, this, these are what create the vital nature of the internet, the, the integrity of the experience. And again, because we have folks already there working in this area, determining you know, how and where to draw the line between where the net has been operating and where it's going to go from here. Uh, Yochai Benkler has a good phrase. He calls it regulatory abstinence. And I think that's a good way to think about it in this context as well. Finally, just two quick real life examples. We already talked about SOPA and PIPA. Uh, the, both bills suffer from the same common defect. They sought to regulate functions in all three of the layers in order to address concerns about specific upper layer activities. There are some suggestions about things like follow the money, uh, the follow the money approach that was, that was uh, recommended by some. That one actually can, I think, be uh, hopefully thought of as attacking the right problem at the right layer. It may not be the right solution, but it's the right type of solution. The second example is the ITU. I would submit that some of the proposals that are being presented to the ITU actually violate all three dimensions. So the substantive nature of what they're trying to do is wrong. Um, what the instrument they're trying to use, an international treaty, which may become mandatory, is the wrong kind of institutional implement. And finally, it is the wrong organization. As an arm, the telecom arm of the UN, it's the wrong place to be doing this stuff. I would respectfully submit that they should stick to their telecom knitting and leave the rest of this to the folks operating already in the middle layers. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, our tally so far is two to nothing on the ITU um, proposals. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and probably weighing in further, but a very valid point is made that um, legislation obviously can be constructive and it can be destructive or interfering. And with something like the internet, one needs to be very careful that the legislators actually understand what they're getting involved in so that they can be comfortable that the um, end is what they want to achieve as opposed to um, something that is actually destructive. In that sense, I will note that the FCC has long had a policy in appropriate situations of regulatory abstinence and has abstained and has done um, extensive regulatory proceedings on abstinence where that is appropriate to leave what is appropriate to be left alone, alone and to intervene where it is necessary to um, fill in all of the gaps and certainly from discussions this morning there are a lot of gaps to be filled in so there certainly is a role for the regulator um, and perhaps for the legislature as well and we will hear more about that in the panel um, after lunch. Uh, now we will move to our final speaker, uh, last but certainly not least on this panel, our old friend Mateus Kurth. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I, I think we have some common ground in the discussion, and I just would like to streamline it a little bit in this uh, last statement. Uh, we agreed that the impact of the technology revolution on the, on the uh, classical wireline telcos uh, is a main reason and not the OTTs. I think uh, uh, voice over IP, all IP technology uh, are sometimes better used by the OTT players than by the classical telcos. That was, in, with some telcos better, you know, in France, I think France Telecom, even before the internet, invented the Minitel, which was quite successful in those days in France, but they lost a little bit the track. But some are catching up, even with uh, attractive services. German Telecom, for example, has an entertain program and other things. So there is still some efforts also to be in this market. But we have, not, we have to consider that the technology is the main reason and not the other business model uh, of the over-the-top players. While our networks are considered, I think right now, from the financial markets, not by me or by us, uh, like commodities, that, that's for sure if you look on the uh, stock market prices, but commodities uh, have also advantages. You know, I think the electricity or the gas companies live quite well with being a commodity and not a high-risk business 
like uh, like uh, other business in the OTT surrounding. You know, so if there is a division between commodities, it must not be bad. And I think, especially now in the financial crisis, a lot of investors are looking for long-lasting, secure investments and not for risky investments. So I think uh, classical telcos could be ideal, even if they are commodity, uh, for pension funds and to generate stable revenues. And I think not all problems of wireline networks are related to OTT. Uh, I think we have a lot of, uh, and, and you have to differentiate between the players, uh, but uh, a lot of risky international acquisitions, high debt, sometimes also inefficient management, and not adjusting your headcount or your, your stuff uh, to these technology changes are sometimes also a problem. You have to gain efficiency in this market, and that should not be underestimated. On the other side, I think uh, sometimes it's done the OTT players uh, are guys who have a hand who's laying golden eggs. Um, that might be true for Apple, uh, it might be true for Google, but uh, in a less degree, uh, we have to, uh, we discussed it already, we have constant battles and also these players are challenged by, by others. We have the fights about patents and about intellectual property rights. And, uh, Nobody knows what, what will be with Apple in 10 or 15 years, you know. We have seen similar stories uh, with Nokia. Look where Nokia had been 10 years ago and where Nokia is now. Uh, research in motion and others. So we have to realize that these kind of OTT business are high risk business, you know. And nobody guarantees that your, your statement is if forever. And we have seen it with Facebook. Facebook is an enormous success. But you have seen what happened after the IPO, the stock plunged, you know, and everybody now after the IPO is questioned, what is the, bus is the business model of Facebook really sustainable, you know? And now they are thinking how they can enter the mobile market and other things. You know? So there is also a lot of hype, and we have seen in this market, when the internet bubble blast, uh, we had seen that there is a lot of hype in. So the OTT players are also sometimes risky, they are challenged, and they are in competition. So, so it's, uh, it's a little bit black and white, and the OTT is good off, the poor telcos are not good off, you know? So we have to, to differentiate. I think this, uh, there is a problem, and we discussed it also in other conferences, that there is a slow investment, that, that what, what Australia also talked about, in new wireline networks. And in my view, it has two reasons. There is a gap between customer demand, willingness to pay, and cost of the investment. And we see this worldwide, that even in modern networks, when fiber networks are rolled out, not everybody is taking immediately up. You know, the uptake is general very slow, and the willingness to pay a premium price uh, is also very low. In Germany, we made some studies on that, and I think there was a common agreement that people likely might pay five euros plus for extremely better service, but that's the end, you know, because there is no real killer application for them to yeah. say we need it badly now, 100 megabyte access, you know, because the functions people use are also working uh, with their existing standards. So I think this gap is, is there, and that's a gap which is in the market. The investment problem on the other side is not a general investment problem. I think we already have a lot of investments in mobile networks, for example. Uh, the mobile market is, is quite in invested with LTE, you know, and if the regulators do their work and uh, give the digital dividend to the players, there will be an investment because there is an enormous demand for mobile services. There is also not an investment problem in the backbone. We have a lot of different back backbones and backbone efficiency is there. So the only investment problem we have is a last mile, it's a last mile problem, and it's basically a FTTH or FTTP problem. Uh, but we have seen other upgrades in other infrastructures. For example, the cable infrastructure uh, is upgraded with the DOCSIS 3 standard, and we, we don't see an end of that, which is quite efficient for the time being. You know? And it shouldn't be underestimated, the quality of service, which could be done in a technology neutral and cost efficient way by using other technology platforms. So I think the main solution, and I think Gabriel also mentioned it, uh, and, and uh, when I worked in Germany, uh, we had an NGA forum with all players in the market, and we tried to make a common approach for better cooperation. Because it's for sure uh, that it, when it comes especially to wireline networks in the last mile, not everybody should do the same thing. 
So um, there are already many examples for that. And uh, we, we hear speakers from German Telecom. German Telecom, for example, has now on the basis of this forum uh, initiated <laughs> cooperations with small city carriers. Uh, city carriers, and we have similar situations in Italy, which have a fiber network. And uh, German Telecom has a VDSL network. Uh, so, so they are cooperating, they, they, in, and that's possible under the regulatory framework and under the competition framework. So we cleared the issues that it's not anti-competitive, that it's not discriminatory. So you could pool your investment by rolling out fiber networks. And there are examples that fiber networks are rolled out uh, in a slow way. Uh, they are rolled out where the competition is there. And uh, so I think... Um, for, for example, to clear these issues of cooperation is a good starting point, I think, for, for having investment and having better investment done. Wildline companies could offer in a non-discriminatory way a better quality of service. That was also mentioned before, uh, because some people are looking for better quality of service, and this is their core business. Uh, I also think a better speed is wanted by the customer. So if you can offer a better speed than the existing speed and better capacity, uh, this will enhance the service quality also uh, for the OTTs. And in my view, there is a possibility there might be a win-win situation, a win-win strategy, if both sides are focused on their basic experiences and their, their knowledge. Um, for example, we have a long discussion about standards. and. Um, it will be possible to offer different standards over the internet for different qualities. In my view, that was not a discrimination or a violation of the net neutrality principle. If it's transparent, if the customer knows what is done, also the last mile is possible to have, let's say, a better quality of service, and it need not be only the same thing. You know, there's a high speed train and a low speed train. If it's transparent, if everybody can get it, if it's not a, a differentiation in content, uh, then these kind of things would be a way out. But I think in the end of, uh, of everything, um, the demand of the customer <coughs> is a crucial thing and not a political driven rollout program. That might be differentiated a little bit from the Australian strategy, um, but uh, you also mentioned in Australia that you have different preconditions. Um, uh, first of all, I think in Europe we can't do that because we, the, no government in Europe would have that m many billions to put in a in a broadband network. You know, we have now we have debt breaks in Europe. You know, and uh, everybody thinks not only in the south of Europe you have to reduce your debt and not to pile up uh, additional debt by doing. Uh, but I also think it, the, the precondition is different because we have competing infrastructure there. So the harm, and they are upgraded, you know. So, so there is not for a big bang like you did, it, it would be a problem for Europe because what would happen to the other infrastructures which are already upgraded, you know. You can't, you, you can't just shut them down, you know. So the, the big bang is not possible. So for, for us, it might be a more slower strategy, but a strategy uh, which is possible. And I also think if you look on the, uh, the regulatory side, we should keep in mind, let's be technology neutral and cost efficient. Because no, nobody knows you know, what, what technologies might be there in 10 years. You know? We would have been geniuses if we have 10 years ago known what's nowadays possible. You know? DOCSIS 3, even DSL was, was fairly unknown 20 years ago. So there might be always new technologies coming up which are bridging the last mile in a more efficient and, uh, and way and uh, also in a cost-efficient way. So we should keep this kind of competition, but we should have an environment uh, which enables these forms of cooperation. For example, we made, uh, we, we issue, had some issues in our forum uh, where, where all part market participant, uh, participated. The first one was interoperability that was mentioned. Let's clear all the issues in interoperability. Uh, the, the second was in-house wiring. Sometimes it's very, difficult to make in-house wiring in a, in a non-discriminatory way. The third was what is really open access. Everybody understands something different on open access. And uh, the fourth were, were the cooperations. So we were successful in a not forcing a regulatory way, but in a way that everybody agrees, for example, to have a bitstream access product between all market players. So I still hope that there is a, a competitive way to upgrade the network. There is a way where we have investment, where we initiate investment, when the framework is right. So that would be my guess uh, for, for our future. Thanks for your attention. Just a couple of questions. Okay. Because questions, just remember, questioners, you stand between 
the audience and lunch. And lunch. I just wanted to make one comment on um, Mateusz's presentation. The word Dakota is uh, the name of a state of the United States. It is a Sioux Indian word that means community, cooperation, and partnership. And that seems to be a theme of our panel for the entire industry to get together and to cooperate. So we'll start taking questions right now. Yes. Make them just questions. Lorenzo Pilo Telecom Italia. It's a question for Rick. Uh, what I take from your presentation is basically uh, the idea that uh, uh, back when we talk about internet, let's go back to the fundamentals, back to the past, because internet is working fine and nothing needs to be changed. Now, uh, nobody wants to regulate internet, but it's clear, even if today we are talking about uh, this issue, we have this, con this conference, that you know, internet has dramatically changed, and there are issues that years ago were not there. One of the most important issues is this idea of sustainability of the future of the internet. You know, at CPRC, for instance, uh, the, question. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the question is, don't you think that it's more, basically? You know, like uh, PPRC, David Clark, one of the founders, it was saying, transportation is, uh, is cheap, but it's not free. So who's going to, to pay for the investment for the network? So this is my question for you. Don't you think that it's more than just uh, back to the fundamentals? Well, I think saying go back to the fundamentals is not the same thing as going back to the past, right? I mean, these are the fundamentals that continue to function today. The internet actually has adjusted, I think, quite well to the new demands put on it by all kinds of applications that we dreamed of, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, my point is, is basically that we should leave it to the folks in the standards bodies, which can include anybody, right? These are open, transparent processes. Any engineer from any company, from any nonprofit, or any government entity can show up, participate. If they think that things are going in the wrong direction, they can propose standards. And those standards are not simply adopted by fiat. It is then put out for the market to decide whether or not they are adopted. There are some that are adopted, some that are not. And some that, are, that have been adopted, like NATS, that were never part of, say, the IETF processes in the first place. So my, my point is to simply leave it to that process when you're talking about that core, the core functions of the net rather than an international treaty organization or individual national governments who may want to try to do things that by, by sort of messing around in the middle would, would cause all these substantial innocent um, uh, uses problems that would have repercussions all over the, the world. The issues on the broadband side, I think some of their concerns there, that is national government, that's national regulation if there's concerns about you know, the lack of uh, support, sustainability at that level, but I think it's been perfectly suitable to, to work with national governments to make that happen. Uh, if you just pass there, this be real quick question, real quick yes. answer. Uh, couldn't we uh, develop some common ground? Uh, there are some examples. The Avanza plan in Spain, uh, advanced means Avanza, uh, where uh, the EU and the Spanish government came together to subsidize the uh, rural uh, access and to subsidize the poor people's access. And it worked. And uh, now Spain has a lot of problems, but not in uh, uh, internet-based business. That's important. The question, other thing, question, is, the other question related to this is center periphery. Uh, we have the case of Baharicom, which means ocean, which is a cooperation between France and uh, the west of Africa, including Spain and they're developing the ACE cable. And they have a whole backbone. Couldn't we do this in Europe too? Thank you. We need some common ground. A Europe, that's yes. a question to anyone from Europe? The American says yes. The Harikon is American, to be clear, well, on that side of it. Yes, um, Sure, you're raising, you're raising two issues. One is the use of the funds uh, for less dense areas. You could also, uh, the, the other issue is the cooperation to build the essential backbones. And that's what you, of course, and that's what we have to do here also. And we can that. Oh, okay. I'm afraid I'm going to, you know, have to put the end to this just so you can have some lunch. Now, you, the question let's, is where is lunch? Well, let's thank our panel. Oh, let's thank the panel. Thank our panel. Thank you.